I'm Amy Blossom from Jackson County Library Services, and I welcome you to Windows in Time. Windows in Time is a series of local history talks, a program that's been developed by the Jackson County Library Services and Southern Oregon Historical Society. It is also part of the Southern Oregon History Show, which, shows, which airs on Thursday nights at 6 p.m. You can also see us live, though, at the Medford and Ashland Libraries, the first and second Wednesday of each month at noon. So are you ready for some history? Let's go. When I uh, taught at uh, Southern Oregon University in American History, I used to ask students a couple of questions. I actually told them there were a couple of things I didn't really understand about American history as much as I'd studied it. One of them was, I didn't understand why it took women so long to get the vote in America, uh, 70 years longer than uh, it took uh, others, and it, it was 70 years after African American males had been given the vote uh, with the 15th Amendment. So I was, I was always curious about why that process took so long. The other thing that I never, I said I never really could get my head around uh, as a history instructor was how in the world did prohibition ever pass in the first place? Uh, that, what that really means is that freedom-loving people, which Americans are, uh, were willing to give up a private right. And I found that kind of odd. Uh, and so I understand uh, mechanically how it happened, but I always was curious about that, those two questions. And then thirdly, I was particularly curious, what was it like in Southern Oregon uh, regarding both the women's vote and prohibition? And so I did some research on that, and that's the basis of my talk, which is saloons and suffrage in Southern Oregon. So some people attribute the suffrage for women, uh, the vote for women, uh, to the fact that there was a kind of pioneer spirit. Because if you look at a map, you'll see that uh, the women get to vote in many of the western states, but uh, very reluctantly in the south and in the east. So some people attribute it to that. Uh, the slide that you are looking at now with uh, Wyoming uh, very early, uh, Utah, Colorado, Idaho, Washington, California. Uh, obviously all these states, western states as we think of them, uh, granted the vote very early to women. But how do we account for Oregon's vote for women? Uh, here is a rundown on this particular uh, slide showing you the first attempt was in 1884 and it was defeated uh, by 72%. Uh, in 1906, well actually 1900, it was defeated. 1906 it was defeated. 1908, it was defeated. 1910, it was defeated. And in 1912, finally, Oregon uh, granted the vote to women with 52% approval. So I'm not sure an or a pioneer spirit actually explains Oregon's voting record. It seems this is, this is the most defeats of women's vote anywhere in the United States uh, was actually here in Oregon. So apparently these little campaign pins that you uh, see that say uh, no on suffrage were pretty effective, at least in uh, the immediate area. Now, there are some other things that come from this period. Uh, there, there are some very certainly famous uh, situations, uh, well known to uh, historians, but also well known to uh, any general reader of American history. Uh, probably uh, a lot of people know that Susan B. Anthony came here in 1871, and she actually went to Roseburg, she went to Jacksonville, and she was an advocate, as everybody knows, for women's suffrage. Um, but there were some interesting quotes from some of the uh, men who encountered her on this particular trip. Uh, the, as they say, it was as though the coming of the circus had been announced. We will checkmate you with a free supper and a free dance, a Roseburg saloon keeper said, because he thought that would cancel anybody going to Susan's speech. Um, 
another response from the uh, Roseburg Plain Dealer editor. Uh, she has the gift that all married men are compelled to uh, admit has been given to women. A fluent tr tongue, but of politics, she, law, and logic, she is ignorant as a child. Uh, and then finally, uh, a Jacksonville response. She possesses not the most distant approach to beauty. Uh, her message accompanied but little, accomplished but little, uh, but for the advancement of the cause. That was the editor of the Democratic Times in Jacksonville. So uh, this 1871 appearance has actually uh, been shown as an example of the hostility towards the women's vote in Oregon, probably unfairly, as, as we'll talk about that. Uh, Susan B. Anthony joined uh, Abigail Scott Dunaway, uh, who invited her to, this, to Oregon to fight for the cause. Uh, Dunaway is um, uh, our, probably our equivalent, Oregon's equivalent to Susan B. Anthony, was very instrumental in all those early votes in trying to bring this to a head. Uh, unfortunately, though, when she went to Jacksonville at one point, she was egged and uh, hung in effigy and burned in Jacksonville, just uh, her effigy, not her, <laughs> and, uh, in 1879. Uh, and she was, uh, that, that episode is written about a great deal, that one and the rejection of Susan B. Anthony. And so it, you get the impression, if you didn't know any better, that Southern Oregon is very hostile towards uh, women's vote. Uh, her... These were called Jacksonville arguments, in fact, these eggs that were thrown at, uh, at Susan, or, and particularly at Abigail Scott. Uh, Abigail said, only one egg hit us, and it was uh, fresh and sweet, and it took, the, it, took the, uh, uh, took it square on the scalp and saved us a shampooing bill. Uh, after this, they... Uh, uh, both uh, ended up at uh, the Culver House in uh, Talent, uh, where they were received more friendly. Uh, so if, if, is there a connection here? Does the vote uh, in, for women uh, in Oregon equal uh, Oregon going dry earlier than the rest? And uh, it has not occurred in other suffrage states, was the argument. An argument that was used against the women's vote was the idea that they would, of course, vote for prohibition. They just assumed that. Uh, but you can see the power of the women's vote uh, reflected in this particular slide. In 1912, 144,000 voters. But by 1914, with the women able to now vote, there's 260,000 women voters. So it ch does change politics in a significant way. However, Many of the southern Oregon towns had already gone dry before the women's vote. And Abigail uh, Dunaway totally disagreed. Uh, she said that uh, it, was not, uh, it was not prohibition uh, that was the problem. It wasn't the abuse of alcohol that was the problem. It was the lack of the right to vote. Uh, what women need is not arbitrary laws for the coercion of men, but liberty for themselves. They are taxed without representation and governed without consent. The classic argument, uh, constitutional argument. Women are not proposing to govern men. Uh, we are uh, seeking his, uh, we are not seeking, we are seeking to govern ourselves, not other men. We could not rule men if we would, and would not if we could. Prohibition binds, equal suffrage liberates. And so she, she continued that opposition uh, to prohibition throughout her uh, campaign and throughout her years as a suffragette. So sometimes I think there's the assumption that there's this direct linkage and not always the case. Uh, her argument was that the best strategy is what she called the still hunt. And that is where you work behind the scenes with prominent men and you try to convince them to put issues on the ballot. And as you saw, she put a lot of issues on the ballot over a five-year, or over a many-year period. Uh, she ran five different uh, proposals. Uh, she believed in suffrage first. Supporters of prohibition are ruining any chance of suffrage success, she said. So take one issue at a time. Don't try to overdo. 
Now, Oregon was pretty open on the saloon laws uh, up all the way through its history. In 1887, uh, statewide prohibition was defeated. Uh, saloons were allowed to operate. Uh, a local option was very common uh, in Oregon. Uh, and the only problem with local option was that some communities would be wet and some would be dry. Well, that meant that there were actually special trains that were sometimes run between um, Grants Pass and Ashland, depending on who was dry and who was wet at that particular time, so that people could get their, their alcohol. In 1908, 23 counties out of 34 were dry. Um, and that's half the population. So this is all before the women's vote now, or, or the granting of the women's vote in 1912. Uh, 1914, statewide prohibition does win 58% voter approval, and it was enacted uh, eventually in 1916. So, so the you know, state of Oregon is way ahead on both prohibition legislation and votes for women. Yet what this all means is that 900 Oregon saloons and 18 breweries in 98 towns had to close because of prohibition. Now, there were dry states before, 19, before the National uh, Amendment, the 18th Amendment the 19, in 1919. Uh, Oklahoma, Mississippi, all these states, and if you notice, they're heavily concentrated. They tend to be heavily concentrated in the southern states uh, that were dry, and a number of people attribute a strong religious uh, flavor to that which there is to uh, prohibition in general. But you can see a variety of states have gone dry even before the 18th Amendment. And there's a religious appeal of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which was very, very strong in all the Southern Oregon communities. And I find this kind of an interesting ad that you have in front of you. It says, am I my brother's keeper? And today, I suspect the answer would be, well, no. But in those days, the answer was, yes, overwhelmingly, you are your brother's keeper, which means you better darn well vote to abolish alcohol. That's an Oregon ad, by the way. Uh, prohibition campaign pins. Uh, the, the thing is that every woman knew a friend uh, who was helpless or saddled with a hard-drinking husband. And so the emphasis on uh, women logically voting for prohibition was, was often made. And the appeals of prohibition were the home. Um, the home versus the saloon. And there, here you have a po couple of postcards here that show that very emphasis with little kids. Little kids were always on the prohibition buttons uh, showing that uh, uh, do this for my sake. And uh, you see the one on the left here in red, uh, vote no for my sake, please vote dry for me. These were prohibition um, appeals and they were a heavy uh, emphasis uh, on women and those homemakers and their children. Now, there, were, there was another answer. This was an interesting answer and this is a fella in um, Portland, uh, Simon uh, Benson, who was uh, very uh, successful in the... Uh, uh, lumber business, and uh, he, uh, he was a timber baron, and he gave $10,000 for Portland to install bronze drinking fountains. Uh, and his assumption was, these are called bubblers, and uh, they're called <laughs> Benson's bubblers. And the whole idea was that people, if these were strategically placed around town, instead of going to the tavern at, at noon, they would go get a drink of water out of the bubbler. Um, there actually were uh, a number of them built throughout, uh, uh, in 1912, were, th were built throughout Portland. Uh, the equivalency to what he donated for that today, that $10,000 today in today's dollars, would be the equivalent of $240,000. It would be over a quarter million dollars that he felt so strongly. There are still 52 of these bubblers left. So if you want to go around Portland and see what you could find, you will, in fact, find these. Um, local choice was really the most popular position. It's a reasonable position. Why not just let each community decide whether they want to have a uh, prohibition or not? Uh, and then the next level down is the local towns. 
Uh, you have counties that might have certain restrictions, but should the town be able to choose for itself? And in fact, that's exactly uh, what happened for a period of time. And it was encouraged, and some towns would ban it, and other towns would not. So it was a real checkerboard as to where you could drink and where you couldn't. All of this before national prohibition. Uh, this is, there actually was a, a local option liquor law passed at the uh, state level, which gave this, allowed saloons and gave this chance to people to make their own calls. And there's another side to this, and that is that uh, besides alcohol and the, the women's vote issue, which are kind of intertwined here, or at least I'm trying to explain it, kind of intertwined, um, women don't a number of men did not believe that women belonged in politics. They believed that politics was dirty, it was filthy, it was crooked, and they really uh, were kind of paternalistic, I suppose you could say, but they were trying to, in fact, protect uh, women from the evils of politics, so there was a lot of emphasis on not allowing the vote. <clears throat> but by 1912, there is a new style of campaign. Uh, Abigail's gotten old, uh, frankly, and she's ill, and there are problems with her health, and she sits out the 1912 campaign, which, if you remember back to my chart, is the only one that passes. Um, all the others had failed up to that point. In 1912, uh, she brought in national speakers. Uh, she didn't, but uh, those who were now the, new, the younger versions brought in uh, national speakers. They used mass advertising, paid newspaper ads, testimonials. They formed suffrage clubs. Um, and there were even, uh, in Portland, there was even an African-American women's separate club. Uh, because they were segregated at that time. Posters, handbills, leaflets, campaign pins, votes for women's ribbons, parades, theater presentations. There were mass meetings, debates, factory lunch uh, meetings, and uh, there were suffrage picnics that served suffrage pie and suffrage coffee. So you got that if you were, if you were in favor of suffrage. Uh, there was even a very interesting... Um, uh, play put on in Klamath Falls where the men dressed in drag uh, at a ball to uh, encourage, uh, somehow <laughs> encourage, uh, the celebration of women's suffrage. Um, so it was a different kind of campaign than Abigail had run. This was not the still hunt where you just worked with the, with the most effective men, or the most powerful men at the top levels. And it worked. Uh, the 1912 had passed with 52%. One of, the, one of the approaches was a postcard like I have up now, which said, uh, uh, you send this to your friends, and it's, it's like a chain letter. And that, in fact, uh, you say you're voting for that particular uh, person, and as a result, you're voting for that particular initiative, and then others will vote for it as well. And then there was the, uh, uh, the biblical reference from an Oregonian cartoon which shows that uh, it shows Washington and California and Idaho all have women's suffrage before Oregon. And it's, the comment is, it's not good that men should be uh, by themselves. Or, and uh, that this is a, a, you know, kind of a reference to a biblical reference, but it's also uh, an attempt to shame men into voting for suffrage. There are a couple other attempts at that same thing. Um, uh, this is a 1911 California poster that was used in the 1912 Oregon campaign. They, they traded back and forth. They used each other's tactics and arguments. That's what the new younger women brought to the campaign, was a kind of a modern approach to things. Uh, here's some other approaches that they used to, to shame male voters in 1912. Um, Women can vote on equal terms with uh, men in Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, uh, Washington, California. Why not in Oregon? Uh, and then you see a map on the other side, which is actually was a postcard, and it says, um, Oh, Oregon, um, uh, can't we fill the gap? And because we're the only state that we're surrounded by states, in fact, that uh, have voted for uh, women's vote. 
So it's a very sophisticated campaign, actually kind of very modern campaign like we might see today, and this was 100 years ago. Now, okay, one of my other questions, the third question I had was, what's going on in Southern Oregon? What's Southern Oregon all about? Uh, uh, first of all, I'm now beginning to understand why, uh, after all this research, beginning to understand how the women's vote uh, took so long, but I'm also beginning to understand um, uh, how um, the prohibition occurred. But I'm still curious about Southern Oregon. And so here's an example, and if you notice on this map of Oregon, you will see Southern Oregon, every county voted yes for women's suffrage. So don't be um, sort of bamboozled by those early reports of uh, Susan B. Anthony and Abigail being egged in Jacksonville uh, or being uh, criticized uh, early on because, in fact, when push comes to shove, Southern Oregon is right there voting as well. Uh, Southern Oregon's uh, progressive on both saloons and suffrage, I found out. Uh, and here's a whole, whole list I put on a slide of the various things that uh, were happening during that time. All this is happening before the national legislation. And uh, in both cases, both uh, regarding saloons and suffrage, uh, Southern Oregon is well ahead. Ashland was... Uh, uh, kind of a hotbed of, of the Women's Christian Temperance Association, and those folks also were big advocates. There. But so they were organized in all the uh, communities around here, Talent, uh, Phoenix uh, had organizations, Medford had organizations, all kinds of speeches and debates. Uh, I just went a little too far. This next slide is a uh, Medford debate, a suffrage debate, and uh, C.E. Uh, C. E., uh, Whistler uh, of uh, Medford will uh, debate uh, the proposed women's suffrage amendment uh, with uh, Professor St. John, R.H. Burns, and Bert Greer. And it will be officiated or refereed, they say, <laughs> by a judge. Uh, and, and it's going to be at Memorial Hall in uh, Medford. The only problem is uh, the fellow that was supposed to... Uh, Opposed women's suffrage was a no-show. So the, uh, the men simply uh, gave their speeches and went home. But there were, in both Ashland and Medford, there were people who opposed uh, these, these various things. Uh, in fact, a byline written uh, by a woman in Ashland, why I'm opposed to equal suffrage. And it was quite a lengthy piece that she wrote. In fact, this particular woman was also uh, in the voters' pamphlet, uh, early voters' pamphlet. She was one of the authors of the arguments against suffrage. So we don't want to get the impression that everybody went down the line uh, uh, together. And there were opposition. There was also opposition in Medford, and uh, fairly articulate opposition from women, uh, not just men. But it's a 52% uh, victory. Uh, and at last, uh, the congratulations are sent from Roseburg, of all places, uh, to uh, Abigail uh, for her success. Uh, maybe that's making up for uh, the things that were said about her way back in the 1800s. And this is, uh, on the right, you'll see uh, Dunaway's actual voter registration card, uh, which was uh, something she was very, very proud of. And this is a, a classic picture of uh, Oregon's Governor West, uh, with Ab who was a big supporter, by the way. Um, in fact, he heard, he was a young boy, uh, and he heard her speak. Uh, he was um, uh, just uh, uh, 10 years old, I think. And he heard her speak and at a rally uh, as a young boy, and she asked the question, why shouldn't your mother be able to? vote if those drunkards that come out of the taverns and saloons can. And he thought, she's right. And he supported uh, women's suffrage as much as he could as governor. Uh, and here he is, her uh, writing the proclamation uh, in the governor's office. And he, he honored her because it had been, uh, Abigail had spent most of her life, frankly. What's interesting, another odd twist in all this, and this is what's the fun about doing these kind of uh, local history looks at things, is you, you, you find things that are odd. Uh, for example, 
uh, her, uh, Abigail's brother, Harvey Scott, was the editor of the Oregonian. Uh, and he was against women's suffrage. And his sister, for all those years, was fighting for it. And of course, obviously, they disagreed a great deal. But he died in 1910 and no longer was writing negative editorials anymore, obviously. Meanwhile, Abigail was too ill to participate in the 1912 campaign, and that younger set that was very much, very modern in terms of how they ran the campaign, uh, were successful. And I, I suppose in a way you could say the fact that, uh, that uh, Harvey and, uh, and Abigail were gone uh, may have <laughs> attributed somewhat <laughs> to the success. Now, the Oregonian uh, women did not stop. Uh, they went on to Washington, D.C., and they fought for national suffrage, uh, along with the other women from uh, the western states uh, that already had suffrage. Uh, and a number of them uh, were arrested. Um, Oregon women were, who were arrested in D.C. for protesting uh, in 1917 uh, included a, a number of people, Alice and Betty Graham, Louise Brandt and Clara Wold, and they were imprisoned uh, as part of this protest. It's so hard to imagine that you could be imprisoned today in Washington, D.C. for advocating the right to a vote. Uh, there is plenty of opportunity for anybody who's interested in this topic uh, for further research. And so what I did was uh, put together some slides that has the names of all the prominent suffragettes uh, in uh, Southern Oregon. And so the first slide uh, contains those women in Ashland and those women in Rogue River who were instrumental in fighting for the women's vote. Also Medford, Jacksonville, Phoenix, and the major women who were involved again in this fight are on those slides. If you, if you notice, this is extensive. This is every city in Southern Oregon uh, that has major suffragette movement going on. Now, uh, maybe uh, some of you can help uh, if you ever get a chance to uh, respond to this presentation. Uh, we, can't get, we can't seem to find good suffrage pictures, uh, pictures of women where we clearly know they're involved in a demonstration. So my question here with this particular slide is, is this a suffrage photo? We're, a number of people think it is. And they are right uh, marching around the plaza in uh, downtown Ashland. But we can't, I've tried to enhance this picture, and we can't read their placards. If we could, we'd, we'd know probably what they were marching for. And we have another picture that's much clearer, and this also is in Ashland. And the question is, what are they marching for? Uh, is this a suffrage march, or is this... A, for, to create a dry town. And it may be that it is a dry town, it may be the Women's Christian Temperance Union, because they're all carrying umbrellas. And they're all dressed alike, and uh, it simply may reflect uh, the fact that the symbol for those who were in favor of uh, prohibition were, was the umbrella, uh, because it was dry. Um, so we're not really sure uh, if either one of these are pictures, it would be fascinating if people did have pictures of the, of the movements. We do know the results, and the results are that uh, women can vote. In fact, there are more women voters than male voters in the United States today. Uh, the first woman elected to uh, uh, Congress uh, was from Montana, Jeanette Rankin. Uh, she's an interesting woman. Another one of these interesting twists, she was there elected to vote against World War I, our American entry into World War I, which was a pretty popular movement. She was elected later, uh, by 1940, to Congress for a second time, and this time she also opposed the United States entry into World War II, uh, which was pretty gutsy uh, at that time because of the uh, enthusiasm after, you know, in light of everything that was happening, and especially after Pearl Harbor. Um, and we also know that uh, we can buy, uh, if we're 21 years old, we can buy alcohol uh, in many places, but not every place. 
uh, and there are places that still are dry counties, and um, so it isn't, uh, it isn't everywhere, but uh, nevertheless, it's, it's mostly there. So thank you for coming and joining us this evening. And open your eyes. Remember, history is everywhere. Thank <laughs> you.